Okay, cohort A. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I hope you did. Uh, hope you maybe took a look at some of that career material that I sent home to you. <clears throat> I actually sent you an email. If you didn't see it yet, <clears throat> pardon me. I sent the email to your um, to your school email. Okay, just FYI. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Um, here we have the food web. Now, this is what I left you with. And I just want to say in the homework, because I said it wrong uh, in the group chat at first, you should have done the first two homework assignments here, okay? Uh, please don't do anything I've crossed out in red, okay? So, like, don't do this, don't do that, okay? Don't do this, don't do this. Anything I've crossed out, <clears throat> please do not do it, okay? So... I'm trying to make it shorter for you. We're trying to cut it down a little so that we have time to at least do a few interesting things in ecology and then we're going to move on from uh, from there to the RST and you'll get one day in class next week to work on the or you know in the coming days to work on the RST. Um, the cheat sheet that you're making that I would like you to make for the, that you're getting marked for. Okay and then uh, and then we'll do the uh, the test with your cheat sheet available and we will go from there that test will cover all the units so just be prepared for that okay so that's coming next week and for you I believe that is on Wednesday next week okay so it's literally a week from from today I think okay all right so now let's go back to we the last thing we talked about was food chains um, one thing I didn't talk to you about was food pyramids so I'd like to talk to you about that okay uh, it has to do with food chains, and I just want to show you how this works. Uh, you can construct a pyramid, okay, and at the bottom of the pyramid are plants, okay? They have to be producing organisms. And then here on the next level, you have the herbivores. Here are the predators, and at the top, we have a secondary predator or the top predator at the top of the food, at the food pyramid. And... The why we picture it like a pyramid like this is because either by mass or by energy, the most abundant biomass has to be, okay, the largest biomass has to be on the bottom of the pyramid, okay? And they, plants then, will per, pass about 10% of their energy on to the next level, let's say right here. And then the herbivores pass 10% of their energy onto the next level. Okay, and then at the top, you have the smallest amount of mass and the smallest amount of energy that makes its way to the top. Okay, so by far in both mass and in energy uh, concentration, plants have to be the most like abundant by mass and they also are the richest source of energy that we have in the food chain. Okay, so if you look all over the plants, the greatest accumulation of biomass is in the plant material. It's in the producing material that photosynthesizes to get its energy, and it really must be that way, okay? Now, by the way, aquatic ecosystems can have uh, a pyramid, similar type of pyramid as well. You can start with seaweed or phytoplankton, which are photosynthetic organisms using the sun's energy to produce their food. There's herbivorous consumers, which consume those organisms, okay? Then there are first level carnivores, second level carnivores, third level carnivores, and finally your top carnivore, like a dolphin there at the top, okay? At every single level, you are losing some energy, so there are some losses all along the way, okay? And of course, what decomposers do when the animal dies is they recycle some of that energy and mass and put it back into the bottom Okay, where the plants pick it up, okay, uh, like, you know, let's say the sediment at the bottom of the ocean <clears throat> where the plant, like seaweed, will grow is picking up nutrients of the dead organisms and recycling those nutrients in the food chain. Okay, so those are, those are examples of food pyramids. Now, we can have what we call a pyramid of numbers, and this is kind of an interesting way to think of it, okay, a pyramid of numbers. So here, uh, uh, one offspring, that's not the number 10, that's not one spray, it's 10, sorry, it's, uh, it's not 10 spray, it's one offspray. One offspray is a type of predatory bird. So that bird 
let's say in the span of, let's say it needs to eat at least one large meal per week. Okay, let's just say for the sake of argument. So over the course of 10 weeks, it would need to have 10 northern pike, okay, to feed off of. Now these birds of prey will typically feed on more than one type of fish, but just for the sake of argument, let's say that's, that's what it needs, okay, is that particular fish. <clears throat> now these 10 northern pike, each one of those northern pike every week has to eat at least one perch. So that means the 10 northern pike would require 100 perch in order to survive for those 10 weeks, okay, in this 10 week period. Now each of those perch has to eat even a smaller fish called a bleak, and each perch needs 10 bleak, one every week to survive, okay, and therefore you need a thousand bleak, and each of those bleaks eats 10 freshwater shrimp, okay, one per week again, and so it takes 10,000 freshwater shrimp to feed a thousand bleak, okay, so 10 10,000 freshwater shrimp feed 1,000 bleak, which in turn feeds 100 perch, which in turn feeds 10 northern pike, and that in turn feeds just one osprey. So here's the interesting thing. It technically takes 10,000 freshwater shrimp to nourish the osprey, osprey for 10 weeks, right? So that top predator depends on the abundance of all of the animals below it in the food pyramid, okay? So... In other words, this osprey at the top needs all of these other organisms in the food chain to be thriving in that food chain in order for the osprey to sustain its life, okay? Now, a pyramid of numbers like this is usually looks like this, looks like a pyramid with the biggest number of organisms on the bottom. But every once in a while, one of the producing organisms is unusually large in terms of its mass. So here, we have one, gosh, one tree, and one tree can feed 10,000 insects because trees are so large, right? So a tree is only one organism, but it has a huge biomass, okay? Trees are the largest living organisms on the planet, okay? Some of them are much larger than a blue whale, which is the largest mammal on the planet, okay? So 10,000 insects can feed off just one tree. So when that happens, the pyramid here looks inverted. Okay, so this is one tree here. This number here is 10,000 bugs. Okay, whatever it is, and insects. And up here we have 20 birds that are feeding on the insects. And so that single tree at the bottom is sustaining all the animals above it. Okay, that feed off of the the insects feed off the tree, and then the birds in turn feed off the insects. But still, it's just a single tree that's providing all the, uh, it's the single producer in the food chain. It still has the largest mass and still holds the most amount of energy, that single tree. But by numbers, the pyramid can look upside down like this. So this is what we call an inverted pyramid. Usually a pyramid is larger on the bottom and smaller at the top. So this one's an inverted pyramid. Only a pyramid of numbers can be inverted like this because there are certain producers like trees that are just so huge that you can have one individual tree feeding a whole uh, population of insects. Now, if you go by mass here, you have this, you know, 10 million kilograms per square meter or per square kilometer of grass will feed so many, so much biomass of snowshoe hair. That in turn feeds 4,200 kilograms, this is a typo, 4,200 kilograms of red fox. And the red fox, apparently wolves eat red foxes, but you know, whatever. That will in turn feed 2,100 kilograms per square meter of uh, wolf, okay? Here's how the energy works. Producers get 100% of the energy here you can see at the bottom, because they produce it. So they have 100% of the food energy that starts out in the food chain they only pass 10% of that along to the herbivores. And the herbivores only pass 10% of that number to the carnivores, okay? Which in turn pass just 10%, okay? On to the secondary carnivores and again, 10% on, the, every time you go up a level in the food chain, you're only passing about 10% of the energy. So let me give you an example. 
let's say we started with a thousand joules of energy, okay, that the producers have absorbed from the sun. They're only going to pass a hundred joules on to the herbivores, okay? Those herbivores will only pass 10 joules onto the carnivore, okay? And the secondary carnivore only gets one joule, actually, okay? Whereas, one joule here at the top, whereas the apex predator at the top is only getting 0 0.1 joules. So apex predators require an enormous number of producers to sustain their life. So that happens to us when we eat meat. Okay, let's say you eat a cow or something like that. Well, to sustain the cow, you need a large area of grass. Okay, and the cow will only pass about 10% of the food energy on uh, in the food that you're eating from it. Okay, so that's called an energy pyramid. All right, that was it for food chains. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to talk about the pyramids last time we spoke about this. So let's get to the new lessons for today. All right, this is a hippo and a hippo with, you'll notice the birds laying on the back of the hippo here, okay? Now those birds are doing, you can see one here, they're doing the hippo a favor. What they're doing is they are picking off um, ticks, okay, off of the, the uh, hippo skin. So ticks are parasites, okay? And so the birds are cleaning the parasites off the back of the hippo. And that is doing a great service to the hippo because it's keeping the hippo free of parasites, which are not only annoying, but they can carry disease. And the birds are getting a meal out of it, okay? So both organisms benefit from this relationship that they're having. And today we're talking about relationships between organisms. That's one of the lessons for today. Biotic interactions are just different kinds of relationships that organisms have. So here, this in this case of the hippo, both benefit from the relationship and so it's an example of something that's mutually beneficial and we call that mutualism it's a mutually beneficial relationship between hippo and bird now in case you're wondering you and i have good bacteria inside our intestines that are also an example of mutualism so having good gut bacteria is turns out to be a very important thing in our health and longevity is how good your gut bacteria is so we have bacteria inside our gut that is not us like it's not our dna it's not our cells it's foreign bodies inside of our intestines that help us to break down and digest food okay and this gut bacteria they benefit from us and the food that we eat we benefit from them giving us a healthy gut and like healthy immune system. And they also help to break down the food so that we can digest it. So in fact, this is a kind of critical. Uh, here's one that helps break down milk. Now, some people are deficient in some of these bacteria and they have things like lactose intolerance, okay? Lactose intolerance is partly a result of not having a good balance of good gut bacteria, okay? Now there's bad bacteria too. Some that make you incredibly sick, C. difficile, is a perfect example of that. This is the one that sometimes they have outbreaks of this and it makes people very quite ill actually. Now, if we are harmed by the presence of those bacteria inside our bodies, we call those bacteria now parasites. They're benefiting from us, but we're actually getting harmed by them. Okay, even if it's a small amount of harm. All right then, so now we've seen examples of mutualism. So gut bacteria in humans, these birds on the hippo's back. There's many, many, many more examples of mutualism, okay, that we could talk about, but we'll just leave it there for now. So if both organisms benefit, that is called mutualism. Now there's another type of relationship here where one organism will hunt down and kill and eat a, uh, another organism. We call this predation, where there's a predator. So in this case, my favorite predator keep telling you about this guy is obviously benefiting okay from this relationship uh, the prey organism which is this unfortunate squirrel here the prey
prey organism is killed. Okay? And the predator benefits. He gets a meal. Okay? So, um, predator and prey. That's an example of a relationship that we call predation. And, uh, yeah, obviously one organism is benefiting from that and the other one is not. Okay? All right. So, let me introduce you to something that is very likely to be on your eyelashes right now as we speak. So, this uh, picture here I found online. Um, this is your skin around your eye. Doesn't that look lovely? I guess the person didn't have any makeup on. Okay, so anyway, yeah, that lovely, youthful looking skin. That's what skin looks like, guys. It's kind of, uh, no matter how smooth your skin is to the touch and to the naked eye, under an electron microscope, it's a very different story. Okay, so anyway, um, that is an eyelash. So this structure that you see here that I'll just sort of make this red line, that is an eyelash. Okay, and these things that you see down here sticking out of the follicle, okay, or that hole where the eyelash is going in, those are eyelash mites. Eyelash mites are on 80% of the population. They're on your eyelashes, so very likely to be on some of your eyelashes here. Uh, girls, I hate to tell you this, but you're much more likely to have them than boys are. Uh, we're not sure why. We think it might have to do with wearing makeup or something like that because there's really no reason for it to be that way. Maybe it has something to do with uh, the amount of contact you get with foreign objects in your eyes. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, this is what the eyelash looks might looks like when it crawls out of its little hole there. Okay. Uh, anyway, my point to you is this. Um, these mites do not, maybe they're gross and you don't like thinking about it. But they don't harm you in any way. They're not parasites. They don't actually get a blood meal from you or anything like that. They just feed on dead skin cells. And you're shedding dead skin cells all the time. So mites just feed on the dead skin. They don't produce a skin reaction or irritation. They don't bother you in any way. So what we say is this is an example of a relationship that we call commensalism. Okay, commensalism, there's no harm but neither is there a benefit for the host. So you are the host to these mites, okay? And uh, the mites do not harm you and they do not benefit you. They're just there. They're benefiting from you, of course. So they do get a benefit from the skin that you're shedding and stuff like that, but they do not harm you. And the fact that they're there shouldn't really bother you, okay? Uh, that's it. Now there's an example here with a whale Barnacles, barnacles that are on the whale's fin. Here you can see them growing. They latch onto the whale's fin. Uh, it might look like it could be painful for the whale, these things like stuck onto its fin, but actually they're not painful at all. They do not extract uh, blood or anything from the whale, so they're not parasites. They are just, like it's again, it's commensalism. The barnacles do not harm the whale, but the whale does not benefit from them either. Okay, it's not like the birds that are on the back of the hippo where they're helping to get rid of the parasites that might be on the hippo. In this case, the barnacles are just along for a ride and the whales bring them to areas where they, they absorb the nutrients from the water, not from the whale. So they're not parasites for that reason. Okay, so again, that's commensalism. All right, let's talk about parasites. So parasitism is when there's a host organism, like I'm like going to use humans as our example, and then there's the parasite. Okay, the parasite usually extracts something like from the host, like a blood meal is typical. Okay, so they get a little bit of blood, like this mosquito that you're seeing here. Okay, so this insect, the mosquito, is called the parasite, right? And the parasite does cause some irritation and some, even if it's pretty minor, some like harm, quote unquote harm. So you get a mosquito bite, okay, and it's irritating. You lose a little bit of blood, even if it's a tiny amount of harm, it's still a kind of harm. And uh, here we see the human 
in this picture, you see the skin over here, is the host organism. Okay, so a parasite has a relationship with its host where the parasite benefits from the relationship, but the host experiences some irritation, some harm of some kind. Uh, even if it's only a mild irritation, that's still annoying. And that's what we refer to as parasites, okay? Like I said, the eyelash mites are not parasites because they don't bother you, okay? They don't, they don't extract blood from you or anything like that. They're not really causing any harm. Uh, hair lice. Another example of a human parasite. Like mosquitoes, these guys look for blood meals. Okay, and you can see they're very small. They're hard to spot. Let's see if I can circle one here. There's one there, there's one there. Okay, you can see the various, this person's got a serious problem. Normally they're hard to spot because the person only has a few on their head, but they do reproduce like many insects. They reproduce uh, pretty quickly. So this is another insect. Um, this is a human disease. It's human only. So just for interest's sake, um, a, a hair li a lice organism cannot survive off your head for more than 24 hours. So if we were to somehow, you know, clean everyone's head or whatever of these lice, and we could keep the whole world like that for 24 hours, this organism would be completely eradicated. Okay, it cannot survive on the back of a dog or, you know, a chimpanzee even, even a closer relative to us. So human heads exclusively. Okay, so this is a human-born organism, and that's pretty common. So you probably know about, like our, my son, they had an outbreak at school of lice when he was in elementary school. We all had to wash our hair with this, like, medicated shampoo to kill them, even if we didn't know if we had them or not. It's kind of like covid Sometimes you just want, you just do it just in case you have one. And then uh, after 24 hours, if everyone gets treated in the house, after 24 hours, you don't have anything to worry about. So here you can see this one's getting a blood meal. Here are some eggs, you know, wherever they deposit onto your hair. The problem with insects like this is they reproduce in large numbers. But uh, yeah, so hair lice is an example of another parasite. Here's a nice one, a tapeworm. Tapeworms live in your intestines. You could get them by eating raw meat. Okay. Um, humans, like, um, we don't usually eat raw meat like that. And so it is unusual for us to get tapeworms like this here in North America. But in some places where they might eat unprepared or raw meat or whatever, um, you'd have a higher risk. Animals get it. Like this is this is not a specific to human thing. You can have animals, anything that has an intestine can get a tapeworm. But like I said, you have to be a meat eater, and you have to eat raw meat in particular. That's where they come from. And in a kind of gross thing, here's one that's been taken out. They can be up to several meters in length, living in your intestine. Here's something that's kind of gross fact about it. Some people get tapeworms on purpose inserted into their gut. Okay, to lose weight because the tapeworms feed off the nutrients that you're eating when you eat. And so it can help to lose weight, but it's an incredibly dangerous thing to do because the tapeworm, when it gets too large, can like cause spores to be released into your bloodstream and actually kill you. Um, yeah, you don't want to mess with that. So that is a crazy way to lose weight. You, never, you would never do it. Okay, but so uh, yeah, it's been done, which to me is astonishing. Yeah, tapeworms. Nice. They're definitely parasites, right? They're absorbing your food instead of you, and they live in your gut. Unwelcome guests in your gut. Okay, there's another type of uh, relationship called competition. Now, competition is when organisms compete with other organisms for the same, let's say, food in this case. So the hyenas are in competition with the lion here for, let's say, some uh, kill let's say the lions kill something, which is hyena, hyenas are opportunistic animals. So what they do is they'll, they're happy to let the lion kill a wildebeest, let's say. And then what the hyenas will do is they'll come in and see if they can sneak some of that food for themselves. 
and the lion, if they overwhelm the lion in numbers, they can actually scare off the lion altogether. So the lion did all the work, and the uh, hyenas get to eat most of the food, which hardly seems fair, but you know what? That's how nature works. Sometimes lions, you know, lions are the definitely, individually speaking, the larger cat. So here's one that's chasing away two leopards, I believe. Though I don't think those are cheetah. They're just, well, maybe they are. The lion, of course, would never catch the cheetah, but it's uh, just getting it away from its kill. Okay, so this is called competition. Now, there's two types of competition. There's interspecies competition. So that's when it's two different species. So here we have the lion, and here we have the hyena. Okay, and the hyena are two different species, and they're in competition with each other for the same prey animals. And here we have, let's say, the cheetah. They don't follow the rules, that's why they're cheetahs, right? <laughs> okay. And here's the lion, and he never tells the truth. That's why he's always lying, right? But anyway, you have the lion, the lions, <laughs> and the cheetahs. So, um, one never tells the truth, and the other one never follows the rules. Get it? Isn't that hilarious? Anyway, that's also interspecies competition. Now, if it's two members of the same species that are competing, and they, species will do that, like, okay, let's say kangaroo are competing for, it doesn't have to be food, it could be a mate. Um, so often, like, um, you know, male organisms, like, or male individuals will fight each other, and what they're trying to do is win the chance to reproduce. So, uh, like, the alpha male in the wolf population would have been the toughest wolf in the group that had survived all the challenges from subordinate males and he's the only one that gets to reproduce with a female with the alpha female okay so um yeah the other ones like they don't get to do that so you you you're in competition with members of your same species we call this intra which means inside species competition okay and here you see like these two rams and they're going to ram each other in the head, I guess. We're talking about how they seem to avoid concussion. But their brains are specifically made, okay, to uh, not get concussed under these conditions because they really butt heads hard, <laughs> okay? Like, uh, you know, you, they literally ram into each other. So that's also interspecies, intra-species competition. All right, then. Uh, that's it for the relationships. Now, I did put a uh, worksheet. I did some of it for you, so I'm going to push this into your homework folders, but if you could just finish it, it won't take very long, just a few minutes. So, um, yeah, if you look at this, a relationship in which one organism kills and eats another organism is definitely predation, okay? Uh, the relationship between a parasite and its host is called parasitism, okay? So just, you need to memorize these words. A partnership between two species in which both benefit is called mutualism. In fact, there's a really cool example of mutualism where a bird uh, will actually call, make like a worn uh, prairie dogs or whatever, a certain type of animal, meerkats, I think they are. They'll warn the meerkat of uh, an approaching predator by making, a, imitating the warning call of the meerkat. And that's actually beneficial to the meerkats. But sometimes, uh, if the, pen, the bird benefits by the meerkats providing a certain source of food, okay, that uh, the bird would have difficulty getting on its own. Okay, so that's another example of mutualism. A relationship where one benefits and the other is neither harmed nor helped. That's like the eyelash mites. They benefit from you, but you don't really care about them. They don't hurt you and they don't benefit you either. So that's called commensalism. That's, that's the weird word. Uh, organisms fight, okay, over the limited resources. That's called competition. Now, it could be intra-species competition or inter-species. could be lions fighting with other lions. It could be tigers fighting with other tigers. Or it could be the lions versus the tigers, depending on if it was inter-species or intra-species, okay? The organism that lives on another organism and feeds on it without killing it, Okay, like so for example, a mosquito is not your predator because it doesn't kill you, 
when it uh, gets a blood meal from you. But it is a parasite. Okay, so the organism that lives on the other one feeds off of it, so on, like a tick or uh, a mosquito is definitely a parasite. The organism that has this nutrient being taken because of the parasite is called the host organism. Okay, organism that kills and eats another organism as a predator. And the organism that is killed and eaten by another organism is called the prey. Now, you're probably familiar with some of those words. Now, I'm going to let you uh, identify what types of relationships are involved here, okay, as you see them. Just remember that if the organism is killed and eaten, then it's definitely predator prey. So, like, if you look at this first one, wasps lay eggs on the caterpillar so their young have food when they hatch. That caterpillar will be killed and eaten, so it's not a parasite, the eggs. It's definitely predator prey. Like, the wasp is preying on the caterpillar okay like for example if you're worried about it being their young having food well think of it like what what does an eagle do well, an eagle might catch let's say a raccoon okay and then if it has babies the if the eagle has babies it'll carry that uh, that raccoon's carcass up to the uh, nest and let the little guys feed on it right and so yeah the wasp doing the same thing when it lays eggs on the caterpillar and they consume the caterpillar. That's definitely predator prey. A uh, wolf chase, chasing down a deer is another example of predation, right? So, I mean, you can you can figure it out for yourself. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, just identify the type of relationship. The choices of words that you can use are up here at the top. Okay. So there's five different types of relationships there. So just keep those in mind. All right, I got one more thing for you, and then we'll, we'll be done with this for the lesson for today. Um, we're going to talk about nutrient cycles. And so I've given this list, or not this list, these images for you. Okay, so here's the deal. <clears throat> Water exists in our environment, as we know, we know well. We live next to a river. You are made of mostly water. Um, we need water to survive, so we drink water and stuff like that. And then water will exit our bodies when we go to the bathroom. Okay, and also when we exhale, water vapor will come out. But here's the thing. The water keeps getting cycled in the environment. And let me show you how that works. Um, let's start off here in the ocean. Okay, what happens in the ocean is the heat from the sun will cause the water to evaporate and go into the atmosphere. Now, it's cold at altitude. So as those water molecules get cooled, they condense and form clouds. So we call that condensation, which I listed for you here. Whoops, I need to cross it out. I listed it for you right there, it's condensation. Okay, now here's the thing. Wind can blow these clouds laterally and put, make them so they're no longer over the ocean. But, uh, you know, it can also happen that the water gets returned to the ocean just by rain. Here we see that here. That's called precipitation, right? When it rains and that returns the water to the ocean. So this is a cyclical thing going on there with clouds forming and then rain and then it goes back into the bodies of water that are underneath. All right. Living things like plants have transpiration. Okay, so I'll explain that in a second. Let's just keep following the clouds here. So the clouds go over to, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked for, for a second on transpiration. I got ahead of myself. So here, when, when it rains over land, <clears throat> the water can land on the surface <clears throat> and you get surface runoff, okay? So what happens is the water will sort of do this, go on the land, you form streams, which combine to form like rivers, lakes, also are fed by these uh, supplies of water. And then a river might take that water back to the ocean like the St. Lawrence River does in our area. Okay. So like on Finding Nemo, all drains lead to the ocean, right? And when you flush the toilet, ultimately that water is on a path to the ocean. Okay, as it goes to sewage treatment and then it gets put back in the Ottawa River. And then it could either evaporate from there or if it's deeper down in the water, it can just go downstream to Montreal <clears throat> into the St. Lawrence Seaway and then out into the ocean. Okay. 
Um, water that sinks into the ground, like say when it lands on the soccer field or whatever, will sink into the ground, and we call that percolation when it goes through the ground, and then it joins up with the water table, which is what you tap into when you drill for well a well to get water, okay, for your house or something like that. Okay, so there's there's water in the ground as well, and that can ultimately flow into the ocean as well. Okay, now my point to you is this water is constantly being cycled. Okay, it's basically going like that. Okay, from atmospheric water and clouds and stuff like that to precipitation to streams and lakes and rivers and so on, and then to the ocean and back. Now plants can suck up groundwater that's in the water table, like the roots go down here like this. They can suck up water, and then through a process called transpiration, they put it back up into the atmosphere through their leaf structure. Okay, they're basically the leaves sweat, or like, like maybe not enough to feel wet when you touch them, but they're releasing water back up into the air. That's called transpiration when that happens. Okay, so that's the water cycle. Now you need to, just need to know, like it's pretty straightforward, you probably learned about this in elementary school, but that's how water gets cycled in our environment. All right, so now uh, let's talk about another cycle called the carbon cycle. Now here, carbon gets recycled as well in our environment. Like your body takes in carbon when you eat carbohydrates. Okay, now this came from plants. So plants, let's start with the plants. They take atmospheric CO2 and through photosynthesis, they turn it into a carbohydrate. So here, let's call it sugar in the plants, like, like tree sap, okay, in a tree. Now, when the tree dies and decomposes, that decomposing animals will return carbon to the atmosphere or to the environment. Okay, and that's one way that carbon gets back into the atmosphere. But if you eat the plant, okay, so here's you over here. If you eat the plant, you do cellular respiration and you breathe out CO2, which will return again the carbon to the atmosphere in the form of CO2. Okay, now basically the same cycle is happening here in the ocean with the phytoplankton absorbing carbon dioxide okay, from the ocean water, and then the consumers will eat the, the, the phytoplankton or the, uh, the green plants that are under the ocean and the marine ecosystems, and then they will exhale, not exhale, but they will release carbon dioxide into the water, okay? So they'll release, dissolve carbon dioxide through their gills, and so you get like the cycling of carbon here as well, okay, in water systems, very similar to you do, the way you do it on land. Now for humans, we also burn fossil fuels and burning fossil fuels will take uh, carbon that was, has been stored in dead animals that have been dead for millions of years. And when you burn those dead animals, it returns carbon to the atmosphere in the form of CO2, which is the greenhouse gas, okay? Um, also cows and livestock will release methane in their poop, same with us. And methane contains carbon, okay? That's natural gas. And that will also go out into the atmosphere. All right, so that's the carbon cycle. Now there's one more cycle, the nitrogen cycle. This one's kind of weird how it works, but this is impro important, pardon me, for synthesizing protein, okay? So proteins come from plants too, ultimately, proteins and amino acids. And here's the deal. 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, okay, 80%. So that's, the plants though cannot absorb this, okay, plants, unlike carbon dioxide, plants can't absorb N2 from air, okay, they can't do it. They need help. Now to help them, there is something called nitrifying bacteria. I'll highlight that down here in the soil. You have to fertilize the plants. So there's a bacteria that can actually take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into 
nitrates that the plants can absorb. Ammonia, okay, and stuff like that. So you're storing the nitrogen in various water-soluble forms. And then what will happen is now the plants can take this material, suck it up in the roots, which they couldn't do with the gaseous nitrogen, and they can use it to make amino acids and ultimately make proteins. Okay, and that's where proteins come from in the food chain. Now, there's when organisms die, what happens to the proteins in their body, the, the nitrogen and everything? Well, there's denitrifying bacteria that can take the proteins that are in the soil or dead and decaying organisms and return it to the atmosphere. Okay, and that's where the cycle sort of continues. Now, you night industrial processes can release nitrogen to the atmosphere also, like in mining and stuff like that. And we're not going to worry about the water cycle, okay, for now. You'll learn about it later in life in grade 11 biology and stuff like that. So that's the nitrogen cycle. So it's kind of cool how that works. It's a bit like you can read more about it in your textbook. I just wanted to give you a sense of it, okay. Um, this is a great example of mutualism, the nitrifying bacteria. These nitrifying bacteria, those guys there, are crucial for the plants. So they will, some plants actually have, like we call them nitrogen fixing plants, they actually have the bacteria that live on their roots. And so what happens is those plants, with the help of their little bacteria, they're, they're host to these bacteria, and it's definitely a mutually beneficial relationship, okay, both for the bacteria and for the plant. So bean plants are like that. They are um, nitrogen-fixing plants that are able to fix nitrogen in the soil, which benefits all the plants around them. But they do that because they are host. They don't do it directly themselves. They are host to um, nitrifying bacteria. They're host to these guys down here. Those guys live on their roots. So some plants are, have special adaptations for that. Okay, and that is an example of a mutually beneficial relationship or mutualism. All right, that's it for today. Okay, and I just want to take you back to the homework. Um, so for today, we did the cycling of matter. So there's that homework there. And again, you can read this material. It's in your book. Okay, when you're doing the homework, feel free to read it, of course. Now, the... Um, all the different interactions, the predator, prey, mutualism, parasitism, and so on. That's this homework here, so please take a look at that. Um, there's something called carrying capacity where you can ignore that entirely. So if you see any questions in the homework on this, you don't have to do carrying capacity. Okay, That's, We have to skip something. Someone's got to give in this uh, pandemic, and this is it. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to skip the quiz and everything. So those two lessons for today, that's three and four. So now we're up to here. And our plan is to do a few, a couple more lessons, okay, this week on ecology. But then we're going to be finished by the end of this week. So we're going to do um, six, seven, eight, and ten. Okay, so six and seven tomorrow, eight and ten on Friday. And then we're done the entire course. And then you have until next Wednesday to prepare for your RST. And you we're not going to have a test in ecology. Okay, so keep that in mind. And you have until, if you're cohort B, you have until next Thursday for the RST. But you'll be preparing your formula sheet next week when I see you on Monday or Tuesday. So for you, I'll see you on Monday. Okay, so I'll give you that class to prepare yourselves. But you're going to have to do some of that on your own. There's no other way to do it. But uh, that's it, guys, for today, so enjoy the rest of your day, and we will talk to you soon.